Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Aaron Pallas, the chair of the Department of Education Policy and Social Analysis here at TC. And I would like to welcome you to Critical Policy Analysis and Reclaiming the Power of Education, a talk by the authors of the new book, The Politics of Education Policy in an Era of Inequality, published by Rutledge. Here's my prop. Our department was thrilled that professors Gary Anderson, Janelle Scott, and Sonia Douglas Horsford were willing to come to TC, some not traveling quite as far as others, uh, and talk about their work. Uh, in the department, we've been thinking about the distinctions between conventional policy analysis and critical policy analysis, and the role that critical frameworks, such as critical race theory, might play in expanding our understanding of policymaking and policy analysis. I want to thank Professor Kevin Doherty, Professor of Higher Education and Education Policy, for his leadership in organizing this event, and EPSA's Director of Academic Administration, Shereen Alexander, for, for managing the logistics. It's being live streamed, and the video of the event will be uploaded probably in the next day or two. If you're watching the video, you probably already know that on Sunday night, critical policy analysis defeated the New England Patriots 35 to 17. I don't want to preempt our speakers, but I'll note that conventional policy analysis sometimes takes policy goals as given and then looks for rational ways to achieve those goals. By not interrogating where goals come from, this approach runs the risk of reinforcing the order and ideology of existing power relations in society, and in so doing, reproducing existing social inequalities. Our speakers will talk about the tools that can enable policy scholars to critically examine the social and historical contexts that produce what is labeled a policy problem and the policies that are crafted and implemented to address those problems. It's an approach that pays a lot of attention to whose voices are heard, whose knowledge counts, and whose values are on the table. For the next hour or so, Professors Anderson, Scott, and Horsford will hold court on their book, sharing their perspectives on critical policy analysis and leadership practice. Then we'll have about an hour for the panelists to interact with the audience in the form of questions and answers. At 5 p.m., we'll repair to the Everett Lounge, just outside here, for a reception. Now, let me introduce our speakers. Gary Anderson, d directly to my left from that direction, <laughs> uh, is Professor of Educational Leadership at New York University, a, formal, a former middle school and high school teacher. He is an MA alumnus of Teachers College and received his PhD in Educational Administration from Ohio State University. He's a leader in the application of critical and post-structural theories and participatory action research to education leadership with recent work on school privatization and the impact of global neoliberalism on education. He also studies the symbolic dimensions of school leadership, including organizational micropolitics and the ways in which administrators manage the meaning of dominant discourses. Janelle Scott, to his left, <laughs> holds the Robert C. and Mary Catherine Bergenau Distinguished Chair in Educational Disparities at the University of California at Berkeley, with appointments in the Graduate School of Education and the Department of African American Studies. A former elementary school teacher from Oakland, California, she received her PhD in education policy from UCLA. Professor Scott's work focuses on how market-based education reforms affect democratic accountability and equity in US schools. This includes studies of the politics of school choice and privatization, the racial politics of public education, and the role of elite and community-based advocacy in shaping public education. And finally, to the far left, Sonia Douglas Horsford is Associate Professor of Education Leadership at Teachers College, where she co-directs the Urban Education Leaders Program and serves as senior research, senior research associate in TC's Institute of Urban and Minority Education. Previously, she taught at the Graduate School of Education at George Mason University 
and at the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, where she received her doctorate in educational leadership. Professor Horsford retains strong ties to Nevada, as her spouse Stephen currently represents Nevada's fourth congressional district in the US House of Representatives. She's the author or editor of five books, including Learning in a Burning House, Educational Inequality, Ideology, and Disintegration, which was published by Teachers College Press in 2011. Her research focuses on the politics of race and education and the dynamics of urban school leadership. Let me invite our guests to say a bit about how they came to work together on this book, and then the floor is theirs for the next hour or so. Thank you, Aaron, uh, Pallas, Kevin Doherty, and um, the EPSA department and faculty students, um, everyone who's here uh, to join us in this conversation. We appreciate the chance to talk about our book um, and to really have a conversation about critical policy analysis. Um, this book um, really was for our students in many ways. Um, I have admired Janelle and Gary's work for many, many years, um, and it was really an, an honor to be able to write this book with them. Um, and we had had conversations about the need to have a text that we could use in our courses um, for both education policy students and leadership students that could really connect to their real world experiences um, and really begin to look at issues of race, of power, of identity, and how those things interact and play out. Um, in a variety of school contexts, and how we as researchers uh, play a role in shaping those agendas, um, the, the conversations that we have in, um, in the scholarly discourse as well as um, in our classrooms um, and with students. And so this was an attempt to really, um, I think, extend some of the work that's been done around critical policy analysis to um, provide a framework, which I'm going to talk about in the opening remarks for CPA, um, that highlights some of the dimensions that we think are important to do policy work that really looks at some of the issues that, have, that are overlooked in traditional analyses. Um, so one of the, so I, I guess I want to begin with some discussion of the very basic, clicking the wrong thing, notions of policy analysis in, and what they've looked like in the traditional sense. <coughs> So um, when we look at traditional policy processes, for example, oftentimes um, they're very rational and linear, right? There's a series of steps that um, individuals will engage in to, to develop policy. The first is with problem identification and definition. So a problem is identified um, as one that requires a policy solution. And then we move on to agenda setting, where there's a window um, for which a policy agenda can be established, which would then lead to the development of policy, its implementation, and eventually evaluation. And historically, it's been looked at as a linear or circular process, one that is represented by stages or cycles, and that has certainly been extended over time. Uh, but critical policy analysis um, is really helping to um, think about the ways in which issues of race, of gender, of class, and identity are silenced within this process, or not necessarily examined as central to this process. So what we developed, um, again, is informed by previous research um, that looked and used critical approaches to critical policy analysis are how America's history of race, of racism, of class stratification, gender inequality, for example, are necessary to be centered in any analysis and, and um, examination of policy. And so questions like who determines what the problem is? How is a particular problem defined or identified, and what should be done about it. Furthermore, what happens when you and members are of your particular community group is the problem, right? And so thinking about, again, how identity and representation inform the policy process. And so in this book, we really highlight five areas that we think are important to changing the ways in which we look at policy. The first is challenging traditional notions of policy, politics, and governance. The second is examining policy as discourse and political spectacle and really looking at, again, how politics are important to the policymaking process in centering the perspectives of the marginalized and oppressed, um, the, minor the minoritized and their voices and experiences um, in how we evaluate and examine policy. The fourth is inter interrogating the distribution of power and resources. And the fourth is holding those in power accountable for policy outcomes. 
So I want to start with the discussion um, of traditional ways that we've looked at policy. And I'm going to weave in uh, desegregation policy as an example of this. So when we look at traditional approaches maybe to desegregation policy, we often start with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision and looking at the history of separate but equal and how that doctrine has um, influenced segregated schools today. In terms of a traditional approach, we often like to highlight the dissenting opinion and the decision. Where, which I'm gonna have to look up here. Our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are, are equal. Um, and so this would be, again, a traditional colorblind way of looking at the law and determining that we, the law sees no color. However, <laughs> if we are to use, for example, a critical race analysis to looking at this law, we would remember that the majority decision, in fact, declared that, the next one, if one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution cannot put them upon the same plane, right? And so when we look at the difference between what the law declares, that it is a colorblind law and policy, and how it actually uh, meets out in practice, where socially, as um, the majority opinion declared, if one race is, a, it is superior to the other, there's nothing that the law can do about it, that changes the way in which we really look at that policy. It says one thing on paper, right? And it says one thing in the law, but something very different in practice. And so that's one example of how CPA is really seeking to, ch to challenge these traditional notions of power and politics. The second is looking at examining policy and discourse as, as political spectacle. And this again is, this is a great example of the case of the boys from Covington uh, Private School and the, the elder um, who had a confrontation recently at the mall. Did everyone kind of see some coverage of this um, on television and social media? It was all over um, the media. And again, it's just one example of how um, the meaning that we attach to race, um, identity, and power, and the conflict that may be associated with that can um, inform many very different perspectives and way of thinking of looking at a particular incident. Um, so this is just, again, one recent example of how um, policy as discourse and political spect spectacle is an important way of thinking about policy analysis from a critical perspective. Another example that's connected to desegregation is the story of Ruby Bridges, who um, integrated her school in New Orleans. We often look at this photo, as well as the image um, painted by Norman Rockwell, um, entitled The Problem We All Live With. And um, again, it shows another illustration and image of the ways in which race and power, where you have this very little, small, young black girl who is now um, demonstrating her courage in integrating the school but doesn't necessarily tell the full story of what that experience was like. Yes, she was able to play an important role in advancing integration, but little do we talk about the fact that she was in a classroom by herself with only one teacher who was willing to teach her and no parents that were willing to have their children attend school with her. So again, CPA is going to center um, those counter narratives that aren't necessarily a part of the public record when we think about policy and help us to understand why we continue to confront some of the same challenges around educational inequality um, when we lift up narratives that may seem noble and that may be very positive in terms of advancing a narrative of the American dream, um, but really diminishes and fails to um, highlight the ways in which white resistance, racism, um, and the, the experiences of the marginalized and oppressed can tell us a lot about what really happened and how policy actually was implemented. So this is on the top of mind for me, um, given the news around um, what has happened in Virginia, for example, with Governor Northam. Um, there were some racist images um, that were found on his yearbook page. And while that is still, I don't know even to this moment what the decision is um, in terms of whether or not he is going to step down or not, but I think it also highlights the dilemmas for individuals of color who are in positions of power, right, who should be enjoying formal authority but still must grapple with um, the ways in which their identity as a member of a minoritized group also can limit um, the ways that they move and the actions that they take even when they enjoy formal power. 
So I'll quickly uh, read, this was a tweet um, and an image of uh, Lieutenant Governor Fairfax when he stepped down from the dais as it is voted to adjourn for the weekend in honor of Robert E. Lee, who was the head of the Confederacy. He says, quote, I stepped down from the dais in protest of the Senate honoring Robert E. Lee. I don't believe he is someone we should be honoring and certainly not in this way. And so what does it mean to be an individual who is representing the state, for example, in this instance, um, but at the same time is confronting an ideology that is being advanced by the state that comes into direct conflict with who you are and his ancestry. Um, he is a descendant of slaves. He was able to track that back in Virginia. So what does it mean to embody that legacy and at the same time represent a state and an ideology that is in direct contrast um, with who you are and your existence? The fourth um, <clears throat> dimension of CPA is interrogating the distribution of power and resources. And I think this is an area where there has been um, extensive work in terms of how we think about funding, the allocation of resources, both tangible and intangible. Um, so for example, in the um, discourse around desegregation, we often um, will point to funding, adequate resources, facilities, and the things that we know are important to adequately educating a child. Um, but those intangible resources could also be having a seat next to a student that is afforded some privilege, right? Or being in a space that may have um, a larger white population in, in the case of desegregation. And so how do we think about how resources are distributed, who gets what, and from a critical policy analysis, we really want to understand what that looks like and what that, how that policy plays out in the lives of those who have been minoritized. So this is just an example um, of an elite um, private school um, where beautiful facilities, right, open space, children are able to move as they'd like, um, in contrast with many of the schools that we see um, in urban communities with high concentrations of poverty or students of color, where to enter the facility, right, you must be checked, um, and you see the NYPD school safety, um, right, um, barrier at the outside of the school. And so what does it mean to think about how resources are distributed? Again, not just a funding formula or not just a dollar amount, but the types of experiences that students have um, and, and what our role as researchers and policymakers are into, into um, informing how those resources are distributed. And then finally, um, holding those in power accountable for policy outcomes. There's been a lot of dialogue in education leadership and policy around accountability, um, typically high stakes testing and accountability. Um, but CPA suggests that we need to really think about how we are holding those that have access to power and resources accountable. Um, I think of the Great Recession as a great example with the big banks and many suggesting that individuals should have gone to jail. Um, for putting the economy in the situation that we're in, but oftentimes we don't see um, accountability for um, individuals in the banking crisis or um, in the case of schools, those who are run organizations, which Danelle will talk about, uh, and management networks that access public dollars and resources but um, have not necessarily been held accountable for um, their performance and the outcomes for children. And another way of thinking about um, holding individuals accountable for power is really thinking of the power that each of us possess as individuals in a democratic society. So it's not just about those who, again, who may, um, by virtue of the position that they're in, hold power, but that all of us, in many ways, at what we do, um, hold power individually and collectively through the power of engaging um, in government, um, being a part of the political process, of course, our vote, but how do we also hold one another accountable for those outcomes as citizens, as those who are engaged and concerned with policy, um, and in particular those of us who are really concerned and interested in education reform and how we can work to change policy in ways um, that will, um, again, change the realities for students, families, and educators on the ground. We're being very multimodal up here and it's freaking my brain out, so, uh, <laughs> so sorry. Um, so we're like clicking with one thing, no, 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 I'm going to do this one and it's going to be great. Um, okay. So um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for who are watching virtually. We didn't greet you yet, but we, we sort of feel you. Talking to the mic. Talk more. Oh, that means I have to hold the mic too. That's like that another means. hand. Yeah, here you go. <laughs> uh, so you press that down when it's time okay. to click. <laughs> 
So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, how we think about applying uh, critical policy analysis to a very specific case around school choice policy and politics um, and the planning networks that are supporting the advancement of particular school choice policies. Um, we were in, in talking um, just a little while ago, the three of us, we were talking about critical policy analysis and how just that term can kind of be unsettling for some people who are Dis, ha, experience discomfort with the word critical, and so we were thinking about replacing critical with complete or comprehensive, um, and maybe that would feel a little bit better um, if critical uh, is not uh, the word that you identify with. Um, so when we think about school choice policies, um, there's a, a number of competing narratives uh, that emerge uh, in, in the politics uh, of the uh, reform world. Um, so, uh, in many ways, um, I think we can think about the competition along a couple of domains. Uh, today is Rosa Parks' birthday, so happy birthday to Ms. Parks. Um, we acknowledge your struggle and your sacrifice. Um, but many uh, media outlets, advocacy-based researchers, advocates themselves will often hold up school choice policy as a sort of natural descendant of the struggles of the civil rights movement. Um, Right, Arne Duncan, our former Secretary of Education, famously, um, or infamous, infamously, uh, depending on one's perspective, uh, announced uh, at the release of the documentary, the pro-school choice documentary, Waiting for Superman, that it was a Rosa Parks moment, right? And so we see uh, the invocation of, of people like Ms. Parks and others um, in support of a school choice policy and, and um, a very particular kind of school choice policy that's yoked to uh, notions of the market and um, things like competition and privatization. Uh, we hear less about Milton Friedman uh, in this space, right? Um, and yet we know that the vision of Milton Friedman was this, uh, educational services, this is a quote from uh, Milton Freeman, could be rendered by private enterprises operated for profit or by a nonprofit institution. The role of government would be limited to ensuring that the schools met certain minimum standards, such as the inclusion of a minimum content in their programs, much as it is now, much as it now inspects restaurants to ensure that they maintain min minimum sanitary standards. Um, and so, fairly distinct vision um, from a broader civil rights imagination, right? Um, and and uh, thinking about black liberation and the liberation of poor people. Um, but in many ways, these visions, as I said, are in tension with one another as we think about school choice politics. Um, and the, I wanna talk a little bit about how a policy network um, that is not rac necessarily racially diverse or committed to the more liberatory aims of the civil rights movement, nevertheless uses civil rights imagery um, and, um, and symbolism to advance a particular policy uh, perspective. Um, so for example, we have our uh, current Secretary of Education, Secretary Betsy DeVos, who argues that just like the traditional taxi system revolted against ride sharing, so too does the education establishment feel threatened by the rise of school choice. In both cases, the entrenched status quo has resisted models that empower individuals. Nobody mandates that you take an Uber or Lyft over a taxi, nor should they. But if you think ride sharing is the best option for you, the government shouldn't get in your way. We celebrate the benefits of choices in transportation and in lodging, but doesn't that pale in comparison to the importance of educating the future of our country why do we not allow parents to exercise the same right to choice in the education of their child? And so, again, you hear this invocation of individualism, of choice as the realization of empowerment for parents, um, in the words of our Secretary of Education. So this contradicts some civil rights um, impulses. So, for example, in 2016, the NAACP, one of the nation's oldest um, civil rights organizations um, that is focused not only on education, but on broader issues of civil rights, housing, labor, um, segregation, uh, things like that. Um, the NAACP issues a call for a moratorium on charter school growth in 2016. Um, and many people are aware that the NAACP issued this moratorium. Um, what has received less attention is why. Why, why did the nation's largest civil rights organization issue this moratorium? Uh, well, they called for the moratorium on four, uh, grounds of four, four issues that, from their perspective. Um, they wanted to ensure that charter schools were subject to the same transparency and accountability standards as public schools. 
Uh, they wanted to ensure that public funds were not being diverted to charter schools at the expense of the public school system. They wanted to make sure that charter schools uh, ceased expelling students, that other public schools then had a duty to educate. And finally, there was a concern around segregation, that charter schools ceased to perpetuate de facto segregation of the highest performing children from those whose aspirations may be high, but whose talents are not yet as obvious. Uh, and so I just wanted to signal that um, from a critical policy analysis perspective, we really need to account for the ideology here um, and the values, the democratic values that are being expressed here. And it becomes even more important when one considers the reaction to this uh, call for a moratorium uh, from the school choice advocacy community. So from Joel Klein, who some of you are familiar with, I think, in New York. Um, Joel Klein tweets, these are strange times, but to see a great organization like the NAACP abandon black families that want a better education for kids hurts bad. And from Jeannie Allen, sorry, her face and her name got a little cut off there, um, says, these don't look like white politicians to me, Randy Weingarten, who you are all also familiar with. Um, head of the AFT, but also a New Yorker. Um, how dare you say that wanting what's best for your kids is akin to segregation? And so you see the imagery of black people being used in this tweet. Right. But we see this imagery being extended even further um, in some of our uh, public life. As uh, Sonia talked about uh, Ruby Bridges earlier um, and the famous depiction of, of uh, what she endured uh, in the service of desegregating New Orleans schools um, in the Norman Rockwell painting. Well, we saw this imagery used in, uh, right in the middle of Black History Month in 2017. Um, Betsy DeVos had attempted to visit a Washington, D.C. Uh, school, and parents uh, came out and um, others in the community and blocked her entrance, even locking the doors. And this was a political cartoon uh, that emerged, uh, that was published um, um, by the News Democrat, um, the artist was Glenn McCoy, and you see the comparison of Secretary DeVos to Ruby Bridges, right? So in this instance, the victim, right, the dispossessed is the very powerful Secretary of Education, uh, instead of the racial slur that appears behind Ruby Bridges in Norman Rockwell's painting, the slur is conservative. Um, and so this sort of and, uh, uh, positioning of um, Secretary, Secretary DeVos, this champion of school choice policy, right, um, in the same uh, uh, imagery of a, a little black child who is part of a broader civil rights movement. So let me turn uh, to how we apply critical policy now to understanding then who are the networks that are supporting this particular vision, uh, this competing vision of school choice uh, policy um, that's much more tied to a kind of market, um, market tenets that we hear Milton Friedman write about. Um, so in many ways, the terrain of the politics of education, and many of you in this room study this terrain, so you, this will be familiar to you, was fairly predictable, right? We thought about teachers unions and professional associations, uh, government entities, some researchers, research consortia, and civil rights organizations, but a fairly sort of predictable uh, landscape. Um, but in you know, the last couple of decades, with the infusion of a lot of philanthropy and donor money, we've seen um, a real disruption right, of this terrain. Um, and the networks um, have become more diverse, um, some would argue more open, right? um, emanating from a critique that these networks were too closed, right? too impervious to change, uh, too bureaucratic. So, when we think about the reform and advocacy organization um, space in education policy and politics, it's come to include things like foundations, the rise of a um, of, of variety of think tanks, these uh, new think tanks that talk about themselves as think and do tanks, right? Um, so much more advocacy oriented, action oriented, um, more school reform organizations and advocacy organizations and school management organizations and a different kind of research consortia um, emerging. And so government is still mattering a great deal, but we're thinking about how these organizations are actually changing governance and how uh, decisions get made. And, and really from the perspective of teaching policy and policy analysis, how we are accounting for that, right, in, um, in our classes. 
as policy scholars. And so these are just examples of some of these um, relatively newer groups. Uh, many of them trace their iteration to or founding to the early 2000s, for example, that's how recent they are, and yet are quite muscular and um, exerting <clears throat> incredible policy influence. And that's not to say they all share the exact same ideology or policy goals. Um, but if we think about uh, what we know about network theory, right, they share, oftentimes share funding sources. There's um, tight interlock on board membership. And so, um, so many of the hallmarks that we would um, turn our attention to exist in this space. We also see uh, the funding networks um, uh, venturing into how to communicate ideals, right, and ideologies and policy goals through uh, the use of media. So not only social media, but we see the rise of advocacy documentaries um, all coming out around uh, 2010, 2012 or so. Uh, so films like The Lottery, Waiting for Superman that I mentioned earlier, or The Cartel, which is an anti-teachers uh, union documentary emerging, um, sharing again, the same funding networks and some of the um, same kinds of expertise. Um, Waiting for Superman is produced, Superman is produced by Walden Media, uh, which also produces a feature film in 2012, um, starring Maggie Gyllenhaal and Viola Davis, uh, and uh, called Won't Back Down, um, is about uh, enacting a kind of parent trigger law, which allows parents to convert underperforming schools to charter school status. Right, so we're seeing a kind of different strategy and to think about how these documentaries and films function um, as policy artifacts or as Sonia talked about political spectacle. You all can't see that. Um, so <laughs> um, it's also, I, we think about uh, foundations then being at the hub of many of these activities. Um, but what we know from um, a more comprehensive analysis of foundations, and I'll, I'll tell you what's on the slide that you can't see, is that foundations are funding alternative teacher and leadership, alternative teacher um, preparation and leadership preparation programs, um, but also state ballot initiatives, uh, the reform and advocacy, advocacy organizations I spoke about, elections, um, uh, news media and charter school management and real estate development uh, corporations, for example. Um, and in many ways, uh, this uh, infusion of money um, is connected to our new rea political reality under Citizens United, um, which allows for independent expenditures. And so in California, um, which uh, it, a couple of school districts in California have been identified by the Ed Reform and Advocacy community as um, really ideal sites to test some of these market theories, proof points, right? Um, New Orleans and Louisiana is another proof point. So uh, Los Angeles um, is one and Oakland California, where I live, is another. And what we're seeing um, is the rise of independent expenditures. They're not subject to contribution limits. Um, they can advocate for a candidate or an issue. Um, and they're not uh, expended or the activities are not um, executed in coordination with a candidate's committee or a candidate's agent. So it's independent. Um, so for example, the Los Angeles Times reported that charter-affiliated donors spent more than double than teachers' unions and other labor groups um, in the last school board election. Those of you who've been following electoral uh, board politics know that the most recent LA uh, school board race was the most expensive school board race in US history. Uh, so one political action committee, uh, what presented itself as a student group called LA Students for Change. It spent upwards of a million dollars on the race. It appeared to be student run, um, but uh, an LA Times examination uh, so showed that it was actually affiliated with the California Charter Schools Association, right? So you see this sort of splintering of groups. And from an analytical perspective, it requires a different kind of attention, right, to understand um, how these groups move. And so it raises the need to not only examine 501c3 organizations, these are nonprofit organizations that are nonpartisan, cannot engage in electoral politics or policy advocacy, um, but to also examine 501c4 organizations, which can. And increasingly, many groups um, have both a 501c3 arm and a 501c4 arm. And so, what does this look like then? We have um, a heavy foundation um, at the roots of this uh, network and um, which spins off 501c3 organizations but has affiliated 
uh, 501c4 organizations. So just to give one example from this uh, tree, you have Teach for America, which is a 501c3, but Leadership for Education Equity, which is a spin-off of Teach for America as a 501c4 organization and encourages Teach for America alums uh, to run for electoral off, um, for office. Um, so this has created um, new markets, and you know, I, as I, I, we all want to be careful that we don't, in in providing this focus, I'm not trying to overlook the fact that there are many people of color, black and Latinx people, who are leaders in the school choice movement. There are many black and Latinx people and other um, uh, uh, communities of color that are deeply invested in seeing school choice expand and uh, creating uh, greater and more equitable options and. Um, in their communities, and I don't want to negate that existence, and that requires an important analysis as well, but for the purposes of today and our limited time, I wanted to focus on this network um, because I think this is often hidden when we foreground um, the individual desires over a kind of more comprehensive analysis, and so what we see is the, this uh, heavy investment has created um, uh, very new markets, um, and so um, this is the Eminent Properties Trust, a real estate development organization that says, our investment portfolio of nearly $3 billion includes megaplex movie theaters and adjacent retail, public charter schools, and other destination recreational and specialty investments. This portfolio includes over 160 locations spread across 34 states with over 200 tenants. And so just to close this out, I want to uh, come back to, um, you know, juxtapose this uh, declaration of assets and charter schools being a part of a portfolio that also includes movie theaters um, to this insistence of uh, civil rights imagery um, uh, in the kind of the policy network space. And so this, uh, this is a tweet from the Great Lakes Education Project. Um, which in 2014 um, compared the Michigan superintendent of public, edu uh, public instruction who was calling for uh, greater accountability for underperforming charter school networks, um, was just calling for transparency and, and more investigation, wasn't trying to uh, close these school down, schools down, um, compares that act of insisting on um, transparency uh, to being akin to George Wallace, um, who uh, the anti-integration um, governor um, that barred entry to so many black students uh, to education. And so he's saying, have we come full circle on blocking access to education options? Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Gary. I'm going to forgive you one. Okay. So I think um, <clears throat> Janelle Scott is exhibit A for <clears throat> a best example I can think of uh, of someone who does critical policy analysis. And I think this is an illustration of how an analysis, um, sort of macro analysis of the new political economy intersects with an analysis of race, intersects with an analysis of <clears throat> sort of how people are living out their lives and in institutions and gender and so forth. So I think it's really critical, this uh, um, policy analysis is really about being intersectional in how we look at these, at these kinds of issues. And whenever we add critical to something, typically um, it has something to do with some kind of understanding of what's going on at the macro and micro level and how those two somehow um, uh, interact with each other and influence each other. Uh, and I think, uh, I know when Janelle was at NYU years ago, um, I remember she was looking at this business of venture philanthropy and I was a little confused about why, why is this so important, right? And then I, 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 as I listened to her talk about it more and more, I thought, oh my gosh, you know? And one of the things is, if you don't have a, this sort of critical policy analysis perspective, we miss this stuff, you know? Like, scholars are just now catching up with stuff that these groups have been doing since the 1970s and that we really haven't tapped into or understood very well. And so this construction over decades of this political spectacle that's been created, this construction of consent that's been then formatted by these think tanks and these venture philanthropists and so forth, went un, unnoticed really by policy analysts for a long time until some people began to say, you know, I think this is important stuff going on here. Um, so 
what I want to talk about is um, applying CPA to educational, educational practices and methodologies. Click. And, um, and in talking, and I want to talk about sort of the, cu the cultural manifestation of critical policy analysis. Um, because really, in, to the extent that we're looking at this new political economy that's emerged in the last 40 years or so, we have to understand that there's an economic dimension, a political dimension that she's just walked us through, as well as a cultural dimension to it. In other words, how it affects us as individuals and how it, it reshapes our organizations and our, our, the ways that we think about ourselves as professionals. But I don't want the economic part of it to get lost either because ultimately it's perhaps the most, the most important part that our political economy has shifted. And what this shows is that you know we had um, the top 10% um, income drop precipitously in the 1940s when we shifted to a sort of Keynesian um, you know, welfare state, more equitable kind of society that we managed it wasn't equitable for everyone, and we could spend you know the next hour talking about the people who were not included in 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 this period, post-war period of prosperity. But overall, uh, it was a, a, a relatively speaking equitable period in in our society. And then you see the the return to the inequality um, after the in late 70s, 1980. Um, this needs to be explained somehow, right? How did this happen? Who mobilized people to believe that this was normal, that we would go back to this period of the 1920s and these levels of, of inequality? Why did that become okay? And I think this is partly what Janelle's trying to explain. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. And just one other piece on the economy. You know, in the mid 70s, uh, wave just stagnated and profits and uh, pr um, and, and productivity uh, continued to rise, partly because of automation and outsourcing and so on. But the point is that, that the profits were no longer paid out in wages to the same extent as they were before. That difference between the profits that, and the real wages is the surplus value of labor that was essentially stolen from workers and instead is why we see so many billionaires and so many of these donors who have all this money to make, essentially make public policy. I'm not sure that race to the top could have happened without Bill Gates's $500 million that he uh, uh, contributed to that public policy. And these are unelected folks, right? So that, so that economic dimension at the macro level is something that we need to understand. What is, how does that play out in, in, in our everyday lives and in the lives of institutions. Um, and so this cultural dimension of neoliberalism so, is something that I've been working on in terms of how, something that sociologists of the professions call the new professional. And this is uh, uh, occurring across sectors. So whether you're a police officer or a teacher or a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or whatever, your life as a professional has been radically changed in the last 30 years. Instead of looking to your own uh, professional judgment in your own professional associations, you're now looking at these um, uh, metrics that are being used, uh, whether it's high stakes testing, ComStat for police officers and so forth, uh, that are uh, uh, driving to a large extent how you think about what you do in the classroom, how a police officer thinks about, oh, I gotta make my quota, my ComStat quota, so I need to arrest a couple more young kids, right? Um, and so it changes how we think about ourselves as professionals, but it also changes how we think about ourselves as people um, and our relationships with other people, which in, a, in, a, in essence becomes somewhat like commodities. Uh, what am I gonna get out of this relationship, right? Um, we, 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 the, the commodification process is something that we see in our own research, right? How many articles do I need to publish for tenure, right? You know, so who cares who reads them or, you know, but what, what journals do I need to get them in? Um, you know, and I'm going to do a sort of a little critique of this later in my talk. Um, there's also this notion, um, so, so how has this changed at the institutional and organizational level over this period of time? Um, um, the Europeans called this in the 90s new public management and it's beginning to catch on here in the US, but there's basically an assemblage of practices that occur at the organizational level, 
um, that have become part of this new school reform movement. Uh, and it's a global, new, uh, global education reform movement, GERM is the term that's being used, right, at, at the global level. And um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's basically, we all know these, right? And, and if you talk to any teacher, they, they know these because they experience them firsthand. Uh, a greater use of standardization and scaling up of practices. Increased emphasis on outcomes and their measurement using quantitative data. Greater efficiency and resource, resource allocation. Entrepreneurial management borrowed from the private sector. Contracting out of public services to the private sector. The creation of internal and external markets and competition in the public sector. Steering the system from a distance. The public sector as an emerging profit center. And this isn't just, this transfer of private sector logics into the public sector isn't just happening uh, in the public sector. Um, Richard Sennett has a trilogy of books uh, documenting how even in corporate workplaces, um, this notion of short term everything, you know, like the gig economy and so forth is changing even the way people in the corporate sector think about themselves as, as, as professionals. Um, and actually, this is a TC Press book, so I guess I can plug it here at <laughs> Teachers College, uh, my book on the new democratic professional education. So basically we do an analysis here of the two different business uh, waves of business influence in education the first being the factory model school, which let's not forget the business community gave us, right? Even though they're the ones trying to dismantle it, they actually were the ones that created it. And then the second wave of business influence uh, also, which is the one that, you know, that brought us the new public management notions. And, um, and we talk about then the effects of that on professionalism and uh, we're not seeking to return to any kind of old professional that um, we may look back with somewhat nostalgically in this day and age because there were a lot of problems uh, there as well, um, which I won't go into. But um, we, what we're calling for is a new democratic professional, right? A professional that sees their work as ultimately being an advocate for children, aligning with the communities. Um, we here in New York have a terrible uh, uh, relationship between communities and teachers based on the 68 um, Ocean Hill-Brownsville clash between the White Teachers Union and, and, and um, the uh, people of color in the communities that wanted uh, the, some of the p teachers removed. So we, we don't wanna go back to that, but we need to have a different way of thinking about how teachers relate to communities. Um, that's the book in a nutshell. Right? You don't have to, now you don't have to buy it and read it. I just, <laughs> I just gave you the 50-word the version. Um, the other piece about um, the, the, how, how this new political economy uh, plays out culturally is uh, Lester Spence's work is, is very interesting if you haven't read it. And he really does get into these intersections of racism, classism, sexism with neoliberalism, right? It's kind of vertical intersectionality as well as horizontal intersectionality across race, class, and gender. And his book, the Knocking the Hustle, he calls attention to the fact that we used to use the term hustle, particularly in the African American community, as something that you did on the side. It wasn't your job, right? It was some, it was some kind of scam you were running on the side. But he says now we all, we all are hustlers. You know, we are all doing the gig economy. We're all combining three, two or three jobs. They don't have any stability. They don't have any pensions, very few benefits and so forth. The Uberization, if you will, of teaching or of other, other uh, professions. Um, the other piece of this sort of notion of bringing the private sector, like running the public sector is like, more like the private sector. Underlying that is a, is a common sense has been constructed over time that somehow the private sector is more efficient, um, it's um, more effective, um, it's more innovative than the public sector, right? If I were to ask you if you thought that was true, I bet 90% of you would raise your hand and say yes, of course. Well, it's, there's no warrant for that. This is simply not true. Uh, if you look at Mariana Masakudo's book, The Entrepreneurial State, she points out that the cell phone, basically none of the technologies of the cell phone were created at Silicon Valley. They were all, virtually all created uh, in uh, at DARPA, which is the R&D di uh, um, um, division of the, uh, the Pentagon, basically. Um, 
And so uh, Silicon Valley basically created the apps and monetized it and commercialized it and put, put some of the pieces together, but they didn't, because venture capitalists are not gonna invest in that kind of long, all of the failures that have to happen along the way to get these kinds of outcomes, right? The, um, the pharmaceutical industry, 75% of drugs uh, were developed in NIH labs. And yet, Big Pharma is always telling us how, how much R&D they have to spend. That's why they have to charge such high prices. So these assumptions that we sort of all assume are true, those were constructed by these same people Janelle was just talking about. Um, very briefly, and I'll, I'll wrap up, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, critical policy praxis, right, which is a little different than critical policy analysis, which is uh, a, actually a way of thinking about not just analyzing policy, but actually uh, there, there are people out there who are actually working in the trenches to change policy, right? And, and as academics, how do we think about our role, not just as adding another little brick putting it up on the wall of knowledge and hoping that somewhere down the road it's gonna make a difference, right? Um, and I think that there's a, it's a somewhat of a, a crisis among academics now in terms of thinking about, well, if, if, to the extent that our work becomes so commodified that it's, it's behind paywalls in journals that most people can't access, what does that mean for me having this, what my daughter always calls a passion job, right? Those jobs where you're actually gonna make a difference and do something worthwhile. Um, uh, how can I actually engage in some form of policy praxis? And the knowledge framework that we operate on is really a very kind of linear chronological pra uh, process of knowledge creation in universities, think tanks, and so on. Knowledge is somehow we disseminate that out there through our journals and our conferences and so on. Um, and then somebody utilizes the knowledge, right? So they, they pick it up and they, teachers, or in our case, administrators, you know, we read our articles and then they somehow figure out how to apply it in their school, right? Um, what, what I'm proposing here is an emancipatory uh, knowledge framework. Um, referring to Habermas's notion of emancipatory knowledge, it's, which is a much more simultaneous dialogical process in which knowledge creation can take place in multiple sites with multiple participants. In other words, we can create knowledge out of schools where practitioners are doing practitioner research, teachers are researching, administrators are researching their schools, people are doing participatory action research with youth in their communities and so on. Um, Knowledge then, instead of just being disseminated, circulates, right? It's multi-directional. Um, and uh, ironically, when I find that when practitioners are doing research in their schools, they often read academic research because now they're sort of in the conversation based on questions they think are important to ask, not the ones we necessarily identify as gaps in the literature. Um, and, uh, and then they start reading the traditional academic research so that it can be a much more diverse um, uh, mix of, of knowledge um, uh, sharing. And then finally, knowledge enactment as opposed to utilization in which you have agentic subjects at all levels who are uh, taking up this knowledge and using it in some way. Um, I also, just to finish, um, you know, some of us are familiar with institutional theory, and neo-institutional theory, this idea that these, for example, business ideas that are in the business field in a Bordeauxian sense get somehow transferred over into the education field um, in some contested way. And uh, I think some interesting developments in institutional theory around the, the discursive turn and the notion of another critical uh, prefix critical discourse analysis, right? The idea that these, these ideas are coming into the education field as discourses that are being internalized by us. I think my next book is gonna be something called Business Babble, in which we be begin to take a close look at our discourses in education and to the extent that we now talk about things like scaling up and skill sets and you know they, we could probably all come up with you know a dozen or you know dozens and dozens of these examples where we can't even remember what term we used for things before right um, so uh, 
uh, so I, I, I look forward to, you know, sort of, these, the, we're, sort of, we're sort of throwing out the, our ideas from the book that we, with, that we were sort of playing with and that represent some of the work that each of us have been doing. So I think now, hopefully, you know, you can sort of, we're looking forward to getting some really interesting and provocative questions back um, um, to figure this critical policy discourse thing out because it's still kind of being formed. I mean, there's no, there's no defin definitive definition of critical policy discourse. If that's what you came for, we're sorry to disappoint you, but I think we're all trying to figure it out. Thank you. Well, my thanks to Sonia, Janelle, and Gary for leading us through this, this um, overview of the book, and we do now have uh, a good chunk of time for some, some uh, questions. Uh, and we've got two microphones up near the front here. Um, and if you're not sure, a question is no more than three sentences and ends in a question mark. <laughs> and please do, do use the microphones because that'll help with the, uh, the sound for the live streaming. Alan Sadovnik, Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, I want to talk about the politics of education in the upcoming president Democratic primary. I got an email yesterday from Whitney Tilson. Some of you know, may know that Whitney was one of the co-founders of Democrats for Educational Reform and a longtime board member of KIPP. I'm delighted to say that my old friend Cory Booker, whom I've known for more than two decades, is running for president. He is the real deal. I always thought he'd be the first black president, but he'll have to settle for being the second. I think he's just what this country needs, a courageous, smart, pragmatic, squeaky clean progressive who can restore badly needed luster to the tarnished Oval Office. And he's super strong on two big issues for me, education and criminal justice. Uh, having had a front seat to Mayor Booker and Mark Zuckerberg's $100, $100 million gift to Newark and its aftermath, uh, I wonder your, how you think Booker's going to play in a Democratic base moving further and further progressive with his longstanding support of both corporate charter schools, and before he came, became mayor, vouchers. <laughs> Sonia says she's not touching that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think the politics uh, around uh, school choice have shifted, I think, in very important ways um, uh, in the aftermath of the Trump, um, the, uh, Trump administration. Um, you know, some of, some of that is apparent to all of us who have been paying attention to, uh, you know, the, the uh, teacher walkouts last year in red states, right? Um, the recent LA teacher strike, uh, the Chicago teacher, teacher strike from uh, not that long ago, where you're really seeing the kind of progressive wings of unions um, exerting more leadership and framing uh, issues of, um, that used to be sort of the, you know, the bread and butter issues of unions around salary and benefits with this question of resources for kids and that I think has opened up a kind of conversation that I don't think I've heard, for example, in California in a long time, right? Where I, you know, people who are asking me because they know what I do say like, gosh, I had no idea every school didn't have a school nurse. Wow, how did we get here, right? So I think the conversation around public education and what has caused some of the inequality that we see um, has shifted um, because under the Trump administration there's been an embrace of, of the very school choice policies that Democrats for Ed Reform had championed, right? And so um, what's come up in some of some other research that I'm doing on research utilization and policy making that we've been doing since 2011, um, some of these shifts are much more subtle and not apparent to the eye. And um, so, for example, doing some work here in New York City of, of Family Foundation, who has been a big donor to school choice organizations and also Teach for America, um, interviewed them first in 2011 and then interviewed them shortly after the presidential election of 2016. And they were starting to rethink, internally rethink their giving strategy because they didn't want to be um, 
connected with the broader Trump uh, agenda. And so I think uh, Senator Booker's campaign is gonna be situated in, in things that feel a little less um, uh, predictable than maybe they did around um, his time in Newark. Um, and where I think you're seeing more people from the Democratic Party who were really kind of hands off with endorsing any union backed activity coming out and making statements in the case of the LA teachers um, strike. And so, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. I think that, you know, I think it'll be productive to have these debates about public education, the causes for educational inequality, what are the, you know, most promising solutions and what the candidates, the Democratic candidates will do on that. But um, I think that's something that, that he's going to have to contend with. I mean, Domingo Morel's book, I don't, you've probably read it, I think, you know, Yes, um, it's a book called Takeover, and it's about state takeovers. And um, you know, I think that the chapter <laughs> um, that talks about uh, then Mayor Booker's role in that um, is something that I think people would be turning to as well. Yeah. So, Alan, I have the impression that subscribing to Whitney Tilson's newsletter is kind of like when you have a, a loose tooth and you want to keep touching it to make sure it's still sore. <laughs> <laughs> In the fifth edition of our textbook, Give It a Plug, Exploring Education, we finish the book with, with permission from both Diane Ravitch and Whitney Tilson, a excerpted two-part interview, two-part conversation that they had on educational reform on Diane's blog. And it's fascinating. They agree on some things, they disagree on a lot, but it's worth looking at. Hi, my name is Peter Goodman. I write a blog called Ed and the Apple. Um, first of all, I see a lot of students in the audience, and I hope they would come up, come up and ask questions, because uh, to an extent, it's you guys who are going to be running the school system for the next few decades. Um, with all the teacher strikes in unlikely states and Los Angeles and seemingly changes in the air, do you anticipate that in, um, by the way, the first presidential, the Iowa caucuses will take place one year from today. So for the next year, no one will be able to cast a single vote for a candidate. Um, but obviously politics in the end. Will education play a role in the buildup to the 2020 election? Because in the past, it sort of faded away and no one really talks about it. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you views? Is critical policy analysis going to be something which we're going to hear in the presidential debates? <laughs> no. <laughs> my, an my short answer is yes. Um, I think that a lot of what we're talking about as it pertains to critical policy praxis is thinking about how we can take the research and the information that we do have and use that to inform the policy process. So I have a lot of ideas. Um, you know, I think education for all, for example, is one way that we should really think about leveraging the pendulum swinging back to more interest and in, um, a reclaiming of public schools. I, I think we're seeing this in communities across the country um, where people have maybe not have felt so strongly either way as long as things were going okay for their children and in their neighborhood school. Um, but I think the more that these issues are and, and the critical work is kind of being presented in front of folks and as educators uh, particularly teachers and leaders who have been working in this um, under new professional management, right, and have seen the nature of their work change dramatically. I mean, I think we see this with the students that we work with all the time um, in our leadership preparation programs. How have their experiences also, and how will they shape their stance on um, education policy and even seeing kind of their role and efficacy in helping to change it? So I think there's a lot of potential around that and that... Um, that we do have a duty as researchers to make sure that, um, in particular, the students that we're preparing are aware of all of these changes that are happening um, in the policy world, um, how it works, and how they can be a part of changing it. Go ahead. I, I mean, one of the things that, that we were discussing earlier was um, 
you know, the extent to which our current tools of policy analysis, which includes theory making, right, um, the extent to which it's missed so much, right? Um, so, for example, you know, we were—I was—I was saying in our conversation, gosh, you know, who predicted the red state walkouts? Like, whose theories predicted that? And and what have we as ed policy scholars not been attending to that led us to miss that, right? So, what has been happening within local communities, within regions, within states? Um, I think has been a deep and critical examination of the, the consequences of state disinvestment, right, in public education, but across kind of the public sphere um, more broadly. And so I don't know that these issues will make it into the presidential election. I think it'll certainly make it into the primaries on the Democratic side. Um, but I, I, my concern is sort of, well, what are we missing if we are super focused on the things that I think matter, of course, you know, performance of schools, uh, quality, transparency, some of these things, teacher preparation, are we missing some other things um, that, that people within communities, teachers, parents, children, students in schools are saying, hey, look over here, right? Um, and we're not listening. We're not paying attention to these micro and meso level politics that could otherwise inform um, some of the questions that you're asking about you know, predicting the future. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, I think I've noticed a lot of our doctoral students, for example, and, and a lot of scholars too, they jump on this bandwagon and they're, the questions they're asking for their research are defined by these same people, right? So everybody's studying paper performance and school choice and you know who's, who's set that agenda, right? And, and why are we studying these things instead of studying a lot of this other stuff that's going on? Jean Anion wrote a book called Radical Possibilities um, just before she died, she did the second edition of it. And she ends the book by saying that, you know, really educators are in a position to be the center of a new social movement. And um, at the time I thought she was kind of like, you know, a little ro rosy glasses, you know. But what we've actually seen, and this is, I think this is what you're saying, Sonia, is that, that there's a pretty major social movement going around, on around education led by a lot of teachers. I mean, 21% of parents in New York City opted out of testing. Um, you know, we have Teachers Unite and NICOR and various caucuses that have developed in, you know, Newark and in, in cities around the country. Um, we've got wildcat strikes uh, across the country. We've got the UTLA. I mean, there's, there's a lot of activism and advocacy going out, on or out there around education. So I think that the opportunists like Cory Booker, who really is only interested in you know, which way is the wind blowing, right? You know, I think the wind, we're starting to, to push the wind in another direction. And the fact that states like, I think New York just got rid of uh, um, test, evaluating teachers by tests, right? Um, my state, where I live part of the year, New Mexico, went totally blue, and they got rid of the park test altogether. I mean, they're there's, there's states that are completely reversing these policies, and it's because there are people blogging and activists and, you know, trying to change this common sense. I mean, we're up against this massive amount of money, right? But... Um, I think that there's huge progress out there, and, and hopefully it'll break through into the, into the campaigns. I have a question about breaking through. Um, one of the principles that you all, are, you all the three of you, articulate um, for critical policy analysis is centering the perspectives of the marginalized and oppressed. And a mechanism you suggest for doing that is through narrative and counter-storytelling. But I wonder, what you imagine the power of that in persuading people who have very entrenched interests that are not that, that have a different frame. I mean, it's I, I worry that counter storytelling is preaching to the choir, uh, and, and and that it, it's Wh a which choir? Pardon me. Which choir? The choir of people who are already predisposed to recognize that um, marginalized and oppressed groups. Um, have not had a seat at the table and, and are the victims of uh, historical generations of, of, of policy. Um, how, and I wonder, if, uh, again, uh, this is, I'm violating my own rule. This is more, <laughs> it's more than three sentences, but there really is a question here. Um, uh, as I reflect on 
uh, propaganda like Waiting for Superman, I don't think that had much effect mm. in, in hindsight. It certainly attracted a lot of attention when it came out, but I'm not convinced that those kinds of propaganda efforts really move people very much. And so I'm worried that counter storytelling and other narrative tools might have similar weak impacts. Mm. And would, would you agree? <laughs> <laughs> It depends. <laughs> I mean, you know, if we think about this propaganda, as you call it, um, you know, I don't know if this is still practice, but um, Teach for America Corps members um, going through the induction process in New Orleans uh, were shown that film. And so I think if we think about effects, I'm not sure we, it depends how we're measuring those effects. And if one of the effects is toward a common sense, um, I think that's a space to examine, right? So how, what, did it, what does it mean to see this documentary as part of your induction into a profession um, in a program that says it selects future ed leaders, right? You're being selected to lead, um, either system level, um, at the electoral um, political level, um, that there may be a way that these things actually have an effect that don't show up in some of the metrics that we usually use to measure effects, right? Um, and, I think, at least for me, the bigger point is if we're not looking, we won't know that. And I'm not sure we're always looking. Um, and so that's one way narrative um, can play a role. But I think narrative is just one um, tool to, to deploy um, in the centering of these perspectives. But I think we have to know that very often our tools, um, our analytical tools are in, not only incomplete um, because of the, the technical aspects of them, but they're incomplete in how they're theorizing. Um, I would just say that the counter narrative, in my view, is not simply to persuade others, although I think it can educate those who may be missing or, you know, or missing a certain perspective or not being able to see it, but also in some way shoring up the base. Um, I think in the work around critical race theory in particular, and thinking about the power of counter stories, um, when you see, for example, in the case of desegregation, that so many individuals and communities across the country, right, although they were you know, obviously not near one another, we're experiencing kind of the same um, outcomes, challenges, tensions around desegregation. It helps to build, I think, a whole nother perspective and worldview that um, individuals who are members of minoritized communities may not be able to witness or enjoy in the same way. And so once, for example, in the study that I did with black superintendents, those stories were very individual and particular to those individuals, but once you weave together a larger story, it helps to tell a fuller picture of a phenomenon. And so I think that's where counter-narratives can be useful in maybe helping to shape public opinion, but more importantly, um, serving as the ties that can bind a particular community and set of experiences that may not even be visible or made visible in ways that are important mm -hmm. to policy. I would just add briefly, um, I think narratives like Ivory Goberta Menchu or, you know, ta Coates' book and things like that, th I think those can have a lot of influence, but I think there's a larger sense of narrative, which is, um, I'm doing a study of the media influence in New York State on um, um, public opinion and legislatures, and what these think tanks do is they put out a report that has a certain narrative about choice and things like that, that then newspapers pick up in press releases and so on, and so that that this 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 larger narrative about choice and so forth that Janelle's talking about is really the nar those are the narratives that I think we also have to change. It's kind of using narrative in a little different sense, more like discourse. But mm -hmm. but um, I think what we're trying to do is is essentially change the narrative. Right? <laughs> but that's something that academics generally are not trained to do. So I'm wondering if you have thoughts about yeah. how academics both students of policy and policy scholars might acquire this tools and skills to be able to do that? I would argue that the, a lot of the skills and tools are there. It's who we decide or what counts as evidence or what we choose to count as data. So it could be collected through interviews, focus groups, um, surveys, a lot of the traditional tools that we use, but um, what is the population that we're really looking at? Right? And are we acknowledging that sending the same survey, for example, to two different communities um, may yield 
competing and very different results on the same issue. Um, and that that's something important that we need to acknowledge and lift up rather than saying that there is kind of one washed out average view on a particular policy issue. And I think those nuances and making those distinctions between how certain communities um, or individuals by virtue of maybe their race, class, gender identity um, then shapes their view on a particular set of policy issues. So for example, when we look at the election data from 2016, the presidential election data, I mean, you can literally see it broken down by race and gender in terms of those who supported and voted for Trump and those who supported and voted for Clinton, supported Clinton and voted for Clinton, right? I mean, it literally just kind of breaks down according to race and class. And so what is it about our experiences by race and gender and class um, that then shape our views on policies and how as researchers are we capturing that? I think is the question. I think, Erin, too, I want to like think about your question in relation in a very maybe too narrow way, but in terms of how we think about as, as university professors, how we think about um, not only our own research, but how we approach teaching, right? Um, I mean, my experience is that undergraduates, master's students, doctoral students are really impatient with us right now. Um, they know our disciplinary tools are woefully incomplete. You know, you have a, a whole generation of students who understand um, that economically um, the, the ground, everything is set against them, right? <laughs> and, um, and that we are not being as multidisciplinary, as multimodal um, as our students know the world needs us to be. Um, and, um, and they are seeking out the training for themselves, right? So they are, you know, like I teach a class at Berkeley um, called Research Advances in Race, Diversity, and Ed Policy where we really try and think about, well, what is race, right? And then, and what is race and how is it related to what is racism? And why does that matter then for how we theorize inequality in schools? Um, and so we, st we front in that kind of conversation and it's hard and it's complicated and the conversations are really tricky. Um, but what's interesting is that the students who find this class, I had four students from public health <laughs> last year, um, two from computer science, one from molecular and cell biology, because these students are, want to understand the complexity of our social world and are really dissatisfied with, how, with the narrowness of their preparation. And so they're seeking it out on their own anyway. And so I think we might think about being led by them, right? Um, and really being, let our teaching be informed by this wisdom that they are bringing. They, they are seeing the world, I think, in, in ways that are more complex, more dynamic, that could really vivify our scholarship. Um, and I think if we just sort of relax and let them lead us, um, I know I have learned so much um, from this very, um, and I should mention students from public policy and education as well, um, from the conversations that happen across perspectives, um, all focused on education and race and inequality. Hi, folks. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Riel from the EPSA department. And I think you've already started answering the questions that I was forming while I was uh, listening to this very interesting presentation and reading your book as well. And I wish that the slide that shows the five elements of critical policy analysis were around somewhere, but you guys remember them better than I am. I do. So here, here tell me when I get there. Yeah, you gotta go way back. <laughs> up, oh, that one. What? Great, that there? one. No, one more. one more. One, that one. Okay, so, and again, I think you're sort of, in answering Aaron's question, you've started addressing this, but I'm wondering what you really think in terms of in what way, so I was intrigued by your comment about maybe we should call it complete policy analysis or comprehensive policy analysis. And I'm wondering, in what ways do you think critical policy analysis is a real pivot? Not just an expansion or adding some additional elements or maybe, you know, treating things that instead of linear a little more complexly. In what ways is it really a pivot from the traditional way we do policy analysis? And in the spirit, which you're very good at, of, of discovering the understory or the backstory or the hidden agenda, why do we keep focusing on traditional policy analysis? What's the, 
what's the impetus for, you know, because I think we've been here before. We were here when, when feminists were trying to push critical policy analysis in education. So, why, so in what ways is it different and why do we hang on to the traditions? Change is hard? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. What? So change is hard. Um, I actually think though we're in a moment where we're not gonna be able to continue doing it the same way because of the demands from our students and also from policymakers. So when you think about the traditional policymaker, um, I would argue that the new congressional class, for example, is very different in terms of representation and the issues um, that they're bringing to the fore and that the changes that are happening in that space as well as with students who are aspiring to work in policy spaces and as leaders in schools is going to, um, is going to require us to do more critical work. I mean, based on some of the examples that uh, Janelle and Gary shared around what our students are desiring, what they're experiencing, what they need, um, as well as what with the, with, as, as well as what policymakers, again, um, in a more traditional sense, are interested in, right? We're having a lot more critical conversations about representation, whether it's gender, sexual orientation. Um, we have a historic class of um, women who are now in Congress, the highest number of members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. In my home state of Nevada, we have a majority female legislature. Wow. Right, so by virtue of who is in those positions and the, type, the, the policies that they care about, um, and I think what they're gonna demand from even us as researchers, as well as our students, is going to, I anticipate, require some, a, a more maybe dramatic shift towards more critical approaches. That's my view. Well, I think it's not just in our field. Um, I know Aaron's a sociologist, and I know that in sociology, they have this thing called public sociology, right, which is Burroway and this kind of movement. So, but, but I think in all of the fields that look at policy, and of course, we've, we borrow a lot of the models from political science and sociology and so forth into education. Um, and, and I'm not actually formed as a policy analyst, so I'm probably the wrong person to be. Um, answering this, but um, it seems to me that um, if anything, those more traditional, and particularly as the economists are getting more and more um, influence in our field and bringing these kind of econometrics models in, if anything, I think it's, we're, we're going backwards. I mean, it's almost more difficult now to do critical policy analysis because, you know, universities aren't, hiring critical policy analysts, they're hiring economists who have, I would say, a very, um, I don't wanna say narrow because I think it's important work and they're, you know, they're, they're doing a particular kind of, of analysis, but it, and some of them are probably, um, you know, I, like one of my colleagues, Sean Corcoran at NYU does really interesting work and somewhat critical work. We, Janelle and I have worked with him a lot. So, but, but I think that that the disciplinary influences are really strong, and the and the and the dominant disciplinary people are very strong. And we've always been a sort of we've always had this kind of um, you know physics envy, as we say, with the social you know in education. We we want to be more like the hard disciplines, and so we tend to I think you know bring those in, and they have a lot of credibility in our journals and so forth. So I, I think it's hard to, to bring in, and anytime you have a sort of marginal way of looking at things, it, it's, it's hard to make it stick, you know? So I think, I, I would agree that students are really asking different questions and that demand for a different way of looking at things is, a, is an important impetus. But my guess is that that's happened before, whether it's here or in Europe or you know, wherever it's happened, that, that the critical impulse has arisen and been suppressed before. And so it, I guess I'm asking about you know, uh, what we need to do to gird up to combat the powers that are gonna 
suppress the critical questions eventually. And by the way, if, 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 if it were happening in business that all of a sudden women are running the show, people would say, analysts would say, that's because the real power has gone elsewhere and they let women. I don't know if that's true at the state legislative level, but that's, I think that's a very interesting observation you're, you've just made, um, Sonia, and I'd love to hear you you know, really think about that too at some point, sometime. I mean, I, I think it's important to note that there are, you know, historical antecedents to this moment that we think we're identifying, right? And to, to think hard about analytically, well, what's different about this and, and not. Um, but I, so what's different about now? We are at a rate of economic inequality that, you know, is on par with the Great Depression. Um, feels pretty different than you know, third wave feminism, right? Um, and that, you know, that disparity has implications for political power, right? And, and particularly when we have um, a tax system that has allowed people, right, to accumulate such power through our, our electoral politics. So, um, and then go on to influence public policy in, in a variety of ways. That feels really different um, than these other historical moments that you're signaling. And I think it requires a different kind of attention analytically. And so, you know, I, I identify strongly as a policy scholar. I was a political science major, but I got very frustrated with some of the theoretical, um, contributions, and I am still frustrated with the theoretical contributions from political science around questions of race and racism and power. And so, you know, many of my colleagues who um, derive, you know, their sort of theoretical orientations from political science will talk, for example, about the rise of, of these ed reform and advocacy organizations as jurisdictional ta challengers, right? And I think there's something interesting about that, that they're merely challenging these stultifying bureaucracies um, but the absence of race and gender and the intersections of those things and who these challengers are, um, not to mention ideology, um, seems like a pretty big lapse to me. Um, and so I think we can start with some of these existing theories, but we can't stop there anymore given this terrain. And I haven't, didn't mention, so we have this economic disparity um, coupled with deep racial segregation, right? And that's a really particular moment that we've had, we've had other moments like that and um, that didn't turn out well in this country, right? So. Hi, my name is Mark and you mentioned all the strikes, the wildcat strikes that were not union led strikes. Then after that, we had the Supreme Court decision that says public, <coughs> public workers don't have to pay dues anymore. Um, what are the takeaways and understandings and learnings from the strikes in those unusual states that nobody would have predicted? And those were not just red states, they were white states, mm -hmm. and they were states without union leadership, and now we have them in a practical way actually challenging the ideology of a you know, new class of, of folks who have set the disinvestment in public schools. So could you talk more about the strikes and what you think are some of the takeaways in critical ways or as trade unionists should be thinking about, you know, how we proceed? What did we learn from the strikes? Well, just briefly, one of the things is Facebook. Um, these teachers in these states organized around Facebook and they weren't, it wasn't the union leadership that was behind them. In fact, the union leadership, leadership was ultimately, you know, following after the, the, the rank and file, the, the, basically the teachers who were organizing on Facebook. And in West Virginia, every single county in the state went, you know, it was kind of a sick out because their strikes are illegal there. Um, uh, so I think the power of social media in, in that sense was hugely important. And in some cases, the, the unions were sort of, you know, signing the contract and the basic rank and file were saying, no, we're not, you know, I think in Arizona this happened, They're, they didn't go along. So we have some interesting sort of independent social media movements in those states because of the weak unions. Um, and we have some radical caucuses that are taking over unions that are moving unions into a more traditional social movement notion that they had in the 1930s. Um, instead of the sort of business model 
that they appropriated after the, after the war. There have also been charter school strikes, right? So I think there's also um, some very interesting unfolding politics that, you know, in, in the LA, uh, recent LA strike, one of the uh, concessions to uh, UTLA, the union, was that the, the board would approve language that essentially agreed to a, a moratorium, although it's unclear that's binding by state law. Um, and, and, so, and much of the strike raised the question of the effects of tr on traditional public schools by the growth and concentration of charter schools in the district. And so, um, you know, being framed as a sort of teachers union versus charter school sector um, bite. Um, but UTLA is also working very hard to unionize the charter school sector in Los Angeles, right? And you had the walkout um, from uh, Accelerated Charter Schools, one of the first charter networks in the city, um, in companion with UTLA, and so I think these politics are still very much emerging, you know, not to mention the charter school strike in Chicago. Um, and so I think it's still unclear the extent to which there will be some coalitional politics that emerge between the charter school sector um, and charter school teachers who are coming of age in the movement and are starting to think harder both about bread and butter issues but also about the kind of lives of the kids that they're teaching um, in schools under models that they're coming to question. I think they want you to use the microphone. Sorry, I shouted at you. They want you to use the microphone. <laughs> if, you, if the unions were not providing the leadership, where did the leadership come from in those states? I mean, just social media is a vehicle. It's not the leadership. That's one question. And all those strikes were before the primaries, uh, before the uh, uh, midterms. Thank you. So did anybody, have any of you looked at what happened in the midterms in those states where there were those strikes? Did those teachers who, for the most part, were red state teachers, did that influence them when they got to the midterms? So those are two questions, leadership and how it came out politically. I haven't done that study. You should do that study. <laughs> I, I, I will say that the, um, the uh, leadership emerged, um, a lot of these states from 2008 onward had massive cuts in education and, and the teachers were making something like you know, 30, $35,000 in West for a lot of these states a year and driving Ubers after school, right? And so there was this, this moment of, you know, we've just had enough. And I will say, it, it, to get it back to an example of an academic who's done interesting sort of advocacy work, a colleague of mine, Lois Weiner, was actually one of the, she was like constantly in, in touch with these organizations and advising them uh, strategically. And, you know, Lois is a big advocate of reform unionism, like, you know, not, not pro traditional unions, but reform, reforming the unions. Um, and so there were actually some people who were helping them think through strategically without the union leadership uh, involved. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christian. Um, I'm not actually a policy student or an education student. I'm in psychology and public health is kind of where I live. So thank you for opening my eyes to something I don't really think about that often. Um, and so a lot of you touched on the, the aspect of boundary crossing to, mm -hmm. to answer these issues and a lot of policy analysis you have, sociologists, econ economists, educators. Um, but I think about um, situations like in Oklahoma where fracking was approved near a school that was um, predominantly white and um, well to do and then those parents protested and so went to a, uh, the new site was near a school that was um, mostly people of color, lower income. Um, and so how do we get people who aren't typically involved in policy issues like environmental health folks, public health folks um, in, into the process? I know you mentioned it was dominated by economists, but um, yeah, how do we get other, other folks involved? I mean, I think increasing there, there is work that's being done at, you know, boundary straddling work, as you talk about, and, and I think that's really important, and I think it's, it's coming from spaces that were sort of naturally boundary spanning anyway, like public health, right? So I have a doctoral student um, that I'm working with who's a public health student, but is looking at um, the sort of uh, lifetime effects of um, disproportionate school discipline 
on black children, right? So what it, and looking at you know large scale data sets to see if you can you know, emerge some it, patterns emerge in terms of you know likelihood for dropout, incarceration, um, unemployment, um, but to really think about school policy in a kind of in a broader public health conversation. And so um, I, again, I keep coming back because this is the, the space in which I live. Is I think we really have, have to think hard about how we teach. Um, and are we facilitating this kind of um, boundary spanning? Um, I think more and more people are really focused, I'm finding on, well, what are the social, de social determinants of a phenomenon, right? Um, and I think that frame feels really expansive and welcoming um, to the kinds of disciplinary perspectives you're asking about. Hello. I just want to say thank you for coming here and, and sharing your really important work with us. And the way you've connected the work of Three Scholars, I think, is really impressive and a model for a lot of us. Um, it creates a new hole that's, that's very helpful, I think, in, in the field of education policy. But um, I was lucky enough, so I'm, I, I don't really have a question or a comment, but more a connection mm -hmm. that I want to co-ponder with you all. <laughs> um, and that is, I was lucky enough on Friday to be in Los Angeles and a guest at Roosevelt High School in East LA or Boyle Heights, um, and to hear students talking about the ethnic studies work going on there, mm -hmm. and thinking a lot about curriculum policy and how it connects to what you're talking about mm -hmm. um, and how it relates to the politics and the politics that we're missing in our policy analysis, because a lot of the teachers who were there were very prominent in the strike. Um, and I think what the students were, what they were teaching, what they were able to teach there and what the students were learning there was very generative of the kind of politics that would push back yeah. against the neoliberal reform. So yeah. I just wanted to throw that out there and, and see if you all had thoughts or connections to that because I'm still trying to, to think about it. I just feel like we haven't done enough work in policy lately around curriculum policy. Yeah. And, and I think the critical policy analysis lens would be very important in that, um, in, in thinking about that moving forward. We're very polite. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I've, I was just going to say the ethnic studies piece, and you also had the Tucson situation as well. And what we've saw and what they documented in Tucson is that these kids were um, not only, you know, able to explore their own identities, but it also transformed them as a, their academic work, right? I mean, they suddenly became, I mean, we all know that when we were in high school, we didn't think, you know, we, you know, the, the real world was, we didn't experience it yet. And so, but they were beginning, they understand their history and the importance of these struggles and so forth through that program. And suddenly they realized, oh, ideas are really important. I better know this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that the effects of those programs, I'm working on a study right now on what we're calling third space, lear learning in third space. And that those are really third spaces like Chris Gutierrez and others uh, write about. And, um, and our third spaces are charter schools, basically, right? I mean, that, that's our example of innovation, and yet they're so, they, they've taken explicitly color blind, non multicultural stance for the most part. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the franchises. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and want to give the cultural capital, but without engaging in the sort of relationship between first and second space, which is the dominant culture and their culture and the creation of a third space for them to explore those issues. Um, and it's just like, no, we're gonna teach you the dominant culture and middle class values and Protestant ethic. And that in itself is gonna help you be upwardly mobile, which is problematic on so many levels, right? So I, t you know, I totally think we need to be creating those spaces in schools and outside of schools and after school programs, different places because, you know, we, we tend to have this cognitive, psychological approach to this, but really, it's the sociocultural realm in which I think kids become motivated to learn. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know what more to say about it. I've said enough, but and the activist piece of it, right? The, the community engagement piece mm -hmm. is so crucial. So let's go over here first. Yeah. Hi. Um, so Professor Scott, you briefly mentioned about the people of color who are engaged in with the the movement this the neoliberal movement the school choice reform and i remember from another event that i attended where where one of them um, 
explain how this cho school choice would contribute to equity issues? Mm -hmm. And how would you as a, and other uh, professors too, as a curricular policy scholars, see their narrative? Yes. Sure. So when you say one of them, you meant, you said one of them was saying, was articulating this equity-driven uh, rationale for school choice? Yes. And the, the them in your description, I just wanted to clear who, like who, the who were they? Call, people of call, color okay. and marginalized groups. Right. Yes. Advocating for the school choice that, that what, you right. seem to be. What, what was the setting where that happened? Was, were these yeah. political candidates or? No, it was, hmm. uh, it was in Colombia. It was here? Yeah. Oh, at, across the street or at Teachers College? Uh, at the law school. The law school? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so one, I think, you know, it, I, I'm not here to say that anyone's right or wrong. What's, in, what's, I think, important to understand is, well, what are the ideological commitments being expressed um, that lead one to advocate for a particular kind of policy? And certainly there are people of color um, black and Latinx people specifically, who are leaders in the school choice movement, who really do see this as the best route um, to a kind of individualized empowerment um, that will ramp up to a more collective empowerment, right? Um, and I understand that impulse, um, and, and, and in fact have studied charter schools that started um, uh, to realize that particular vision, that that's their goal. Um, and many charter schools do exist who are working very hard to realize that particular vision. They tend to not fall into this kind of franchise model, right? They are more one-off schools or maybe a handful of schools. And there's like a diverse uh, charter schools coalition, for example, that's trying to really adhere to um, more progressive um, tenets around racial and ethnic uh, integration. And I think it's important to acknowledge that those planes exist within one policy space, as we would expect them to exist in any particular policy space. Um, and I think one of the things that we lack analytically is the ability to understand that people of color have diverse ideologies. And that simply because one is a person of color, it doesn't mean that the, I the ideology or vision you are articulating is a progressive one, right? Black people, since they've been in this country, right, um, involuntarily, um, have been conservatives and black people, you know, we have black neoliberals and I think we need to be able to identify the ideological perspective that is being articulated because it has implications for what kinds of supports, what kinds of regulatory policies, what kinds of um, incentives um, that then follow that vision. And so I think it requires a more expansive understanding of race and positionality um, and as I said, ideology and power. Uh, since I'm somewhat of a teach union thug. Um, uh, the strikes were highly organized, but they were organized uh, locally. Um, there were, remember, in West Virginia, there's a long union tradition. Mm. Now, it's been greatly weakened, but still in all, the, the, tra the tradition goes way, way back. Um, so the strikes were well organized, but locally. Now, uh, the UTLA strike, of course, was a, a very major union. But what happened after the strike are hundreds and hundreds of teachers ran for public office, school boards, state assemblies, all over the country, and a fair number of them were elected. The question is whether this will continue, whether this is really start of a movement, and it should be something very interesting to study, because this can really be a moment where uh, teachers, and, I, and I'm also uh, gonna mention nurses, because uh, teachers and nurses are very closely associated. Lots of them belong to the same unions. So this could be a moment in time when they really seize the moment and have a really, really major effect. And I think it'll be something very interesting to follow as we move into the presidential primary season and whether in the next round of elections there's a much, te there's a much uh, a, a teacher and nurse activism. My name's Liana Cabral. Thank you all for being here. Um, so my question was touched on a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what um, research methodologies would ideally accompany this, um, particularly the centering the perspectives of marginalized and oppressed. Mm -hmm. Centering the perspectives. Centering the perspectives of the marginalized um, and oppressed. Well, I a lot of my work uses critical race theory, which I think is. Um, an example and can be used as critical policy analysis. So I, 
actually re recently published a piece called School Integration in the New Jim Crow Opportunity or Oxymoron where I'm suggesting that we can actually use critical race theory as a form of critical policy analysis by framing our analyses according to the tenets that um, would claim that you know racism is a permanent component of American life, um, that there are um, there is value in the experiences and the stories of people of color, a lot that we can learn from in terms of better understanding how policies actually play out. And it's a source of, um, and means to evaluate the effectiveness of policies, which are usually targeted towards underserved populations, but might not necessarily use their experiences to, to determine whether or not those policies are effective. Um, interest convergence, which is Derek Bell's um, kind of theory of the phenomenon whereby, um, the interests of blacks, is, as he would describe it in terms of looking at black and white relations, the interests of blacks are only advanced to the extent to which um, the white community supports it, or white policymakers or actors are okay with that. And at which point those interests diverge, um, that that policy will no longer um, include the support. Um, and so I think, again, just keeping it simple in many ways, because in critical theory, I think there is a proliferation of terms, right, and we might, um, are still exploring different language to describe these things, but that critical race theory is one example um, of really centering race, helping us to theorize and think about race not simply as a demographic variable or as a proxy for culture, but rather a tool used to distribute resources, um, used to distribute power, and that by viewing policy through that lens, we can better understand why um, we still have for example, African Americans or black people in this country experiencing some of the worst um, indicators on almost every quality of life, right, indicator um, by this singular construct, mm -hmm. which I would argue is a pseudo-scientific construct of race. Um, and that when we look at race that way, um, we can better understand how it's used again to perpetuate and reproduce inequality in schools and throughout society. I think methodologically, you know, the world is our oyster. Like I, I, do, I, I, I think there's maybe a tendency far too often to associate anything that starts with critical as qualitative. Um, and I think there are really amazing qualitative studies that one can do coming from this um, sort of theor theoretical and epistemological perspective. But I think there's incredible quantitative work to be done as well and mixed methods work, um, importantly, um, that, that yokes um, methodological traditions. And so I just wanna, you know, I mentioned Domingo Morel's work earlier, which I think is a really great, um, you know, he built his own data set trying to see if there were a racial, there were, was a racial connection between uh, state takeovers uh, and found, in fact, there was, right? Um, so that's drawing from a critical perspective and using uh, a quantitative approach, right, to, uh, to testing those critical perspectives. Um, Ezekiel Dixon Roman's book, which won the AERA uh, Book Award last year, um, I just looked up the title, Inheriting Possibility, Social Reproduction and Quantification in Education, um, is another example, I think, of some really important critical quantitative work that's emerging uh, in the field. I think social network analysis um, is another space where there's just, there's so much possibility. Um, so I, I would hate to think that we would only, we would equate a kind of critical, um, policy analysis or critical race theory with the idea that can only, it can only be a, a, a qualitative approach. I don't think that's what you were saying, but I, um, I, you gave me the opportunity to say that. <laughs> I would just want to put in a plug for participatory action research. In other words, doing research with rather than on or for people. Um, and uh, I think that the, the advantage is that you have both, it's both about knowledge generation, it's about pedagogy, particularly when it's done with youth, and also about um, action or activism. And um, I'm not sure how your, your chair or your committee would necessarily <laughs> react to that, but I think if, you know, if, I think we need to, I think it's, there's a growing interest in that kind of work. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Mahalik. I'm in the education policy program here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Um, so the confrontation between the Covington students and the Native American elders sparked a really interesting social media conversation with the hashtag Exposed Christian Schools mm -hmm. and the very different experience that students are having in traditional private schools. So I want to know your thoughts on the role of traditional private school in isolating the educational experience of often very privileged students from the issues faced by the rest of American students um, and the, uh, I guess, the way we can use critical policy analysis to um, examine that. 
Well, there's so much there. I, you know, I get the <laughs> honor, the honor of um, teaching in the our Clanstein Private School Leaders Program here at mm -hmm. Teachers College, and it's so fascinating to teach in that program. To also teach in our Summer Principals Academy, um, which is primarily for uh, those who want to work in urban public schools and charter schools. Um, and the, I think the interesting thing around even the experience of independent schools is how different the experience is, the experience is for a student who is a member of right, um, the dominant group, um, probably in many cases students whose parents and grandparents attended that school um, because they really look at it as families, right? Their constituencies are families. Um, and the students who may be members of underrepresented groups in those schools. So, I share that to say that there's just another example of work that can be done around independent schools broadly, um, but knowing that there's still different perspectives even within that space based on the students that are there. Um, Michelle Purdy is coming on, I saw Ansley over there, <laughs> will actually be on campus this Thursday, yeah. um, and she's written a book, the title. So, but I mean, again, I think her work, and I've, I've yet to read the book, but I'm familiar with Michelle Purdy's work, is one example of, again, centering the perspectives of a group um, that has not been a part of the larger narrative around independent schools. Um, and that historical approaches to inquiry too, <laughs> to give another plug, is also a great methodological approach um, to unearthing, again, um, the ways in which inequality has always been with us and how individuals have work to combat it, um, and how others have also worked to sustain it. Um, Aaron, I want to pose a question if I could. I'm Kevin Doherty in the Ed Policy uh, Department. Um, a lot of my research has been on performance funding in higher education, mm -hmm. and which is a, a procedure by which a lot of states have moved to premising some of their funding for higher education on outcomes graduation, for example, rather than enrollments. And what I keep struggling with is I see some elements of performance funding or accountability or even choice as potentially beneficial. And I guess what I'm wondering about is how do we find a way of being able to draw the line or save the progressive element of a policy? And I'm trying to think about is you know performance funding worth saving, and if so, how? And I've, been trying to work on it, but do you have any guidance for where we can sort of say uh, we can? There's something here that's worth saving. We don't necessarily have to completely abandon it, but we also have to be extremely careful. Um, any advice you could give us on on that kind of um, uh, sort of recovery operation? I can try. Um, I mean, I. Amy Stewart-Wells and I wrote a chapter called A More Perfect Union. Uh, something, there's something after the colon about, uh, <laughs> there's always something. Um, just reconciling the goals of uh, school choice policy with um, kind of broader equity goals. And, you know, in the case of school choice policy, school choice has been a tool for both progressive and regressive ends, right? And so school choice has often been a part of uh, desegregation plans, right? So I think it, the, the, the ethos around why you were doing what you're doing and how you were doing what you're doing matters. And so, yeah, I mean, I think if, if we think about high stakes testing and the fact that the, you know, many people in the civil rights community was in, were in support of No Child Left Behind because they were frustrated um, with decades and decades of underserving kids of color. And they thought, well, if we have the evidence, like finally, right? You can't hide anymore. Um, but there were other agendas accompanying that coalition, right? Who really wanted to use those data to punish um, and not necessarily to support the kids um, who weren't being well served. Um, and so I think we have to keep our eye on the sort of the why, the policy tools available, um, and the kinds of supports that are given. And you know, as you know, in the case of um, colleges and universities, you know, so many you know students at Berkeley are experiencing incredible food and housing insecurity um, that has so much to do with whether they complete or not, right? And so, as we look at these outcome measures, are we taking into account what students are going through um, to get through 
right? Um, and are we providing them su the supports they need or are we creating very perverse incentives for universities to not admit these students anymore? Um, and so I think those are some of the questions that we have to keep pushing on is the sort of why, the how, and with what. You know, I'll just give an example. In 1850 in Britain, they had a paper performance model and the inspectors, they didn't have ISTICS testing, but they had inspectors would come into the classroom to inspect teachers and that would determine their pay. So in other words, we're p placing high stakes on the, the evaluation. So the teachers would figure out how to like, they tell their students, if you know the answer, raise your right hand, and if you don't know the answer, raise your left hand. So when the evaluator came in, all the kids had their hand in the air, but the teacher knew which ones to call on because they knew which <laughs> ones knew the answer, right? And so there is this kind of Campbell's law, which is that the more you use metrics to, yeah, and attach high stakes to them, the less likely you're going to achieve your outcome because of these perverse incentives that you introduce into the system. So I think some of it is that it's not so much that testing per se is bad, because we do need a lot of this kind of information for comparative purses and holding teachers. Account. But when it comes down to sort of people's careers or pay or whatever is attached to it, um, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a, losing, a losing cause. And you would think we would have learned that by now. And, and when we're doing nothing to address the underlying inequality and segregation exactly. that it's built upon, right? When it becomes a proxy for that, yeah. So we've come to the end of our two hours. There is a reception in the Everett Lounge just down the hall that'll be starting right away. Please join us and uh, you'll have a chance to, to talk some more about critical policy analysis with Sonia, Janelle, and Gary. And thank you all very, very much. Thank you, everyone.